Uh, folks, my goal today is to get you ready for the exam tomorrow night. Uh, just trying to work through some problems and hopefully get you feeling better about things. This is going to cover electric fields, forces, and voltage. Now, many of us are still struggling with this electric field and forces part. And I've tried to boil down that whole section onto this one whiteboard, okay? And, and if you understand this whiteboard, you're going to be able to work the problems on electric fields and forces, which is most of the test. It's a two-step process. Some source charge creates a field. And how it creates that field is determined by what kind of a source it is. If it's a point source where it's concentrated, then it obeys Coulomb's law, where it depends very heavily on the distance away from the source. Twice as far away is four times weaker. Three times as far away is nine times weaker. Okay? Now, the electric field is always going to be away from a positive source and towards a negative source. That's just general. That's just always the case. This formula just gives us the magnitude, the size. You use this to determine the direction. Now the other way that we can create a, an electric field is with a sheet of charge or more than one sheet. <coughs> if we have a single sheet, then we use this formula where we take sigma. Sigma is just the charge density. That's the source charge that's created the field divided by the area of the sheet. Okay? Now, in this case, we divide by 2 epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is this constant, called the permittivity of free space. The more common situation is I have two sheets, one positive, one negative, with the same magnitude of sigma. In that case, it's just sigma over 1 epsilon naught. But again, the electric field is away from a positive source, a positive sigma, and towards a negative sigma. Now, whether you use that formula or whether you use one of these formulas to find your E, or in homework, you've actually had to use both in one problem. If you've got a point source and a sheet, you find the electric field due to the point source, you find the electric field due to the sheet, you add them together as vectors using superposition. However you find the electric field, the last step is always to find the push or the pull, the actual push or pull, which is just given by this definition of the electric field. Now, this is a vector equation. And that means that if my electric field is to the left and my test charge is a proton, say, some positive test charge, that means my force is going to be to the left. But if that electric field is to the left and I have an electron or some other negative test charge, well, then the force is going to be the opposite direction of the field, because negative left is right. Okay? Now, there's one other way that we can find an electric field, and that's with this equation that we call the Ed equation. Now that equation is the most dangerous equation that you have in your toolbox. That equation will give you the opportunity to lose more points tomorrow night than any other equation. If you misuse that equation, you get garbage. And you misuse this equation when you use it without indices. If I know the voltage from A to B, then the distance in this equation is the distance from A to B. If I know the voltage from the negative plate to the positive plate, then this distance has to be the distance from the negative plate to the positive plate. That's where people make their mistakes, is not uh, using the correct distance. Now, 
you can only use this set equation when you have a uniform electric field being caused either by a single sheet or more than one sheet. Okay, you can't use it when you've got a point source where the fields are spreading out. This is, this is an all exact problem. We have two plates by which we mean metal plates. And those plates are connected to a battery. And we find that if we take a proton and we fire that proton with some initial velocity halfway between the two plates, that it just follows a straight line without speeding up or slowing down. Now, when something travels in a straight line without speeding up or slowing down, you recognize that as zero acceleration. And by Newton's second law, you recognize that the net force on that particle must be zero. Now, in this case, we're not dealing with something like a proton or electron. We're dealing with a, an actual particle of mass m and charge q. And the first question asks, what kind of charge do I have, positive or negative, on this particle? Tell your neighbor what you think it is, positive or negative. Okay. This is where a lot of people bogged down when it was an exam question. And they got bogged down because they didn't understand this symbol right here. That symbol for a battery, by convention, the long line is the positive terminal and the short line is the negative terminal. That's not something you can understand. That's just something that was decided by a committee long before you were born. You just, you just we have to accept it because we weren't at the meeting, okay? Now, given that convention, that means that this plate is going to be charged positively, and this plate is going to be charged negatively, and the battery does that by stealing electrons from the top plate and dumping them on the bottom plate. Now, we know that electric field lines are born on positive charge and they die on negative charge, so I'm going to have field lines that go like that, down. Now, if I draw a free body diagram, uh, let's say when the particle is right here, I would have a weight force, Earth on the particle, and that's just mass times G, gravitational field strength, and that points down toward the center of the Earth, always. Now, in order for me to have zero net force, I only have one other force to work with, and that's the electric force. And that means that the electric force on this proton has to be up. Now, that electric force is the charge of the proton times the electric field. Now, we just said that the electric field is down. If the electric force is up, that means that this, if this is down and this is up, then this must be a negative charge. A negative charge. See if your neighbor understands that. It's got to be a negative charge. Okay. Now, the next part of this problem says, suppose you fired that proton somewhere else. Suppose you fired it closer to that negative plate. Is it going to veer up? Is it going to veer down or go straight across? Well, this weight force is not going to change. That only changes through diet or exercise, believe me. This electric force depends on the strength of the electric field. 
The fact that these field lines are parallel means I have exactly the same elect electric field here as I do here, as I do here, as I do here, as I do here. Everywhere between the plates I have the same electric field. So this force doesn't change, this force doesn't change, my diagram is still balanced. And so that particle is going to go straight across. No matter where I start it, it's going to go straight across. <coughs> Does that make sense? Now, in the last part of this problem, we take the negative plate and we move it further away from the positive plate, all the while keeping it connected to the same battery. And we're asked if we take that same proton and we fire it between the plates, what will it do now? Will it veer down, veer up, or go right straight through? So talk to your neighbor, tell your neighbor what's going to happen there. from the end equation. I'm just looking at magnitudes here. If I'm looking at the voltage from the negative plate to the positive plate, then I'm going to want the distance from the negative plate to the positive plate. Okay? Now the battery, its job is to hold that voltage from the negative plate to the positive plate, constant. That's the same. And that means if I increase the distance between those plates, the electric field between the plates has to get smaller. And I would represent that electric field that's weaker with fewer field lines, further apart. And that means the electric field is now going to be smaller. Still down, but smaller. Now if I look at a free body diagram, I'm still going to have the same weight force as before, but now my electric force, which depends on the strength of the electric field, is going to be weaker. This diagram is no longer going to scream balance, it's going to scream down. And I know that when I have a net force down, I get that free fall uh, parabolic trajectory that we got in 205. If the particle is negative, why does it get attracted to a negative plate? Ah, that is not what's happening. Being attracted to the positive plate. However, the attraction is not big enough to overcome the weight. The weight's always pointing down one way or another. And this is a heavy particle, not a, an electron or a proton. Here, the attraction up to the positive plate and the repulsion away from the negative plate was big enough to overcome the, the gravitational force. Here, not big enough. So the gravity wins. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Oh, did I say it was a proton? Yeah, like did I say it was a proton? Yeah. I did not. I deny it. Okay. <laughs> She's lying about me. <laughs> it's like the politicians. They forget that we film these things. Yeah, it's not a proton. It's not a proton. I, I, I apologize. It was a particle. They both start with P. <laughs> Okay, thank you.
Did I make any more mistakes? Two mistakes in a day and I quit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, while we're here, let's look at this problem that you voted off the island. It wasn't that. Yeah. Natural logarithm we don't need. Okay. We have this floor that is painted with charged paint to give me some sigma, charge density. And we drop a, a rubber ball. The mass of the ball is significant. It's one kilogram. It's not like we're dealing with a proton or a, an electron. It's a, a heavy ball. And this ball has a test charge. It's three coulombs. So it's a dangerous rubber ball. And we find that if we drop it from rest, by the time it gets to a point B that's five meters lower, that ball is really, really moving. Its speed at B is 20 meters per second. Now the first thing we're asked to find in this problem is the change in kinetic energy as it goes from A to B. Well, that's going to be the kinetic energy final, which is when it's at B, minus the kinetic energy initial, that's when it's at A. Well, it starts from rest, so this is zero. So this is going to be one half times the mass times the speed squared, and that's going to be 200 joules, and it's going to be a positive 200. That's because it's sped up. Its change is positive. It's getting bigger. Now, the next thing we're asked for is the change in gravitational potential energy. This is the bucket that we usually ignore in all the problems that deal with protons or electrons. Because if you take the mass of a proton and you multiply it by GH, you still got pretty much nothing. Okay? So it's not worth talking about gravitational energy with a proton or electron. But this rubber ball has a fair amount. And we can calculate that with just mg change in height. Well, that's going to be one kilogram. G is 9.8, call it 10 newtons for each kilogram. And the height is going to be, the change in height is going to be a negative five meters. And so this gives me a minus 50. The gravitational energy bucket is empty, okay? Now, normally, in these electrical problems, I've only got two buckets, kinetic energy and electric potential energy. And it's a zero-sum game. When one fills, the other one empties. Well, this is one of those rare problems where I've actually got a significant mass. And in those problems, I've got a third bucket, gravitational energy. Now, what I found was that when this bucket emptied by 50 joules, this bucket here filled by 200 joules. Whoa, that's something. I mean, if I just drop something over a regular floor where there's no charge involved, if this loses 50 joules of gravitational energy, it gains 50 joules of kinetic energy. <coughs> well, this thing gained a whole lot more energy. It sped up a whole lot more than when I just dropped something over a regular floor. What does that tell you about this floor? Is it positive or negative? Yeah, it better be negative. How do I know that? Because not only is gravity pulling that ball down, but the floor is pulling that ball down. If the ball is positive, it has to be attracted to a negative floor. Now, my next part asks about this change in electric potential energy. Well, it's still going to be a zero-sum game. If I write these, this picture in equation form, it would be Verk external 
is what changes energy. Changes kinetic energy, changes electric potential energy, and changes gravitational energy. But we just dropped the ball. We didn't do any verb on the ball. We just let it go. So this is zero. So that means zero has to equal a plus 200 plus whatever this is minus 50. What's happening to the electric potential energy bucket? Well, if this one is filling by 200, when this is emptied by 50, this one has to empty by 150. Does everyone see that? Now, I know that the change in electric potential energy from A to B is equal to the test charge times the change in voltage from A to B. Now the test charge is whatever actually moves from A to B. It's what actually gets travels from A to B. So if this is going to be negative 150 joules and this is a plus 3 coulombs, then my change in voltage from A to B, I can calculate very quickly. My change in voltage from A to B is going to be a negative 50 joules per coulomb, but that's another way of saying volts. So if this is, I'm making this number up, if this is 2,000 volts here, this would be 50 less than that, 1950 volts. Whoops, down here. Was that two mistakes in a day? Let's not count it, because I want to keep teaching. Okay, give me, a, give me a buy on that. Okay, now, Suddenly I know the direction of the electric field. I know that the electric field points towards a negative source. I also know that a uh, an electric field goes from high voltage to low voltage. Now this was an old exam question. And the part that everyone missed, or most everyone missed, was the last part. Find the electric field at point B. You all did this for homework. Tell your neighbor what you got for an answer. What did you get for an answer? Okay. We know that the electric field is down. The question is how big it is. If you said it was 25 newtons per coulomb, slap yourself hard. That is wrong. When I ask the question, how big is the electric field at point B, I was being tricksy. Okay? The electric field of B is the same as it is at A. The same as it is between A and B. The same as it is over here. It's a sheet of charge. Now, when you use the Ed equation to find the size of the electric field, you have to be, be sure to use the right distance. If I know that this voltage from A to B the magnitude is 50 volts, and I want the magnitude of the E field, which distance do I want to use? The distance from A to B, which is 5 meters. And that's going to give me an E field magnitude of 50 over 5, or 10 volts per meter or I could write that as 10 
newtons for each coulomb. And if I wanted the electric field, I'm sorry, the electric field without the magnitude sign, it would be 10 newtons for each coulomb down. Okay, that's the vector. It has magnitude, that's what this is, and direction down. Does that make sense? Okay, check that your neighbor got that right, please. got it wrong. And so I just want to address the problem. Um, it has to do with this pretest we took, where we dropped a boulder off a cliff. And we found that because we just started the boulder by kicking it, we didn't do any bear, the boulder still had all its energy. But the energy had changed from potential, gravitational potential, to kinetic. Now, if we let that boulder hit the mud puddle at the bottom of the cliff, it stops. And suddenly I go from a lot of energy to no energy. Now, the only way I can remove that energy is for something external to do negative there. And in this case, that something is going to be the mud puddle. It's pushing up on the boulder while the boulder passes down through it. That's negative there. Okay? Now, we never let it hit the bottom because we don't want to calculate how much Varric is done by that collision. That's messy. Okay? Now, when we calculate Varric, we usually do it with a hand, moving things in a controlled fashion, very slowly, from rest to rest. Now, the reason I bring that up is that you have this problem for homework. And one of the questions asked, how much there would you have to do to bring this proton, this, is, this time it's a proton, to bring this proton from two to three? Now the correct answer is, well, first of all, I have to bring it to one, and to do that, I have to do negative there. Why? Because I'm moving it to the left, and I'm pushing to the right, that positive proton just wants to race over there, and I've got to fight, I've got to push against the field to bring it slowly from rest to rest. And then, when I take it from one to three, I do no better, because I'm moving it up, and I'm pushing to the right, perpendicular. So, all the verk is done in going from two to one. That verk, if I do it from rest to rest, is just going to be the change in the electric potential energy from two to one. Now it's a proton, so I've got a, an elementary charge. It turns out in the previous part of the problem, the voltage from one to two was six volts, so the voltage from two to one is negative six volts. So the correct answer to this problem was negative 9.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. But that's not what people put for an answer when it was an exam question. And that's not what many of you put when it was a homework question. What you said instead was, ha <laughs> Greg, you can't fool us. The answer is zero there. I just let that proton go. I just let it go and go back to my living room, watch TV. And that thing's just gonna fly across it's going to smash into that, uh, that purple wall, 
and then I just scrape it up the wall to three. <laughs> I had no varic involved. I didn't have to do any varic. Well, the problem is something had to do negative varic to go from energy to no energy, and that something was the purple wall. Now, I can calculate the varic that I do with my hand in a controlled way, but calculating the varic done in a collision, that's very messy. That's ugly. Okay? And so we don't do it that way. Okay? We don't just let it go and let it crash. Now, quick question. Is that pith ball charge positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Okay? Negative. The electric field goes from the positive plate to the negative plate. The electric field is that way. But the electric force on the pith ball, the push, is obviously that way. Now, whenever the field and the push are opposite, that's a negative test charge. Now, what if I take that left plate and I move it to the right a little bit, an inch and a half? What's that going to do to this angle at which it's hanging? Is it going to get steeper, get a bigger angle, smaller angle, or the same angle? Talk to your neighbor. What's it going to be? Okay. The thing to notice, the thing to notice is that these plates are not connected to a battery. They are isolated or insulated, depending on how you like to describe those. Now, that means that the sigma is stuck. It's the sigma that causes the electric field. If the sigma stays the same, the electric field stays the same. The electric field is what's causing the push to the right. And so uh, the angle stays the same. Now, what would happen if these same plates were hooked to a battery and I moved them closer together? Would that angle get bigger, smaller, or stay the same? It would get bigger. Okay, because the electric field would have to get bigger. Okay, let's look at this problem that you just turned in. You're told that you have two plates, one positive, one negative, and that the electric field between the plates is 7,500 newtons for each coulomb. And that's going to be true everywhere between the plates. That's what we know about plates. Now the first question asks you to find the voltage difference between the plates. We do that with the Ed equation. The voltage difference from the negative plate to the positive plate will be the electric field between the plates times the distance from the negative plate to the positive plate. That's going to be 7,500. I could write that as newtons for each coulomb, but I could also write that as volts per meter. And that's going to be the most useful way to write it. I multiply by the distance in meters, 5 centimeters is 0.05 meters, and that gives me 375 volts. Now I'm going from the negative plate to the positive plate. Is this going to be a positive change or a negative change? As I go towards the positive plate, is my voltage increasing or decreasing? It's increasing, so that's a positive change. And that's the second part of your homework. It asks you uh, which plate, positive or negative, is at the higher voltage. It's always a positive plate. Always a positive plate. The electric field goes from high voltage to low voltage. It also goes from the positive plate to the negative plate. So the positive plate must be the higher voltage. Okay? Now, we fire a proton through the small hole in the negative plate straight towards that positive plate. It doesn't want to be next to this positive plate. It's slowing down. What it's doing is changing kinetic energy into electric potential energy. We're cocking the spring. Now, sometimes we cock the spring with an external force, like the hand. But in this case, we're cocking the spring by changing kinetic energy into electric potential energy. They want to know how much electric potential energy 
it would increase in traveling between there. That change in electric potential energy, as it goes from the negative plate to the positive plate, is going to be the test charge times the voltage from the negative plate to the positive plate. This is a proton. The thing that travels between the plates is the test charge. So I've got 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This voltage, we said, was a positive 375 volts. Now a volt is just a joule for each coulomb. So the coulombs cancel, and I get plus 6 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. What that means is that if I fired a proton with that much kinetic energy, 6 times 10 to the minus 17 joules, that proton would just barely make it. It would slow down, slow down. It would just barely get across, kiss the other plate, and turn around and go back. Just barely make it. Now the last part of this homework asks, what if it starts out with this speed? Will it make it? Well, that depends. How much energy is that? Well, the kinetic energy that it starts with, in that case, would be one half times the mass of the proton times the initial speed squared, one half times 1.6 times, whoops, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, times that speed of two times 10 to the fifth squared, and that gives me 3.34 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. Is that enough to get across? No, it's only going to make it a little more than halfway across. A little more than halfway across. Okay? That was the problem that we just turned in. Okay, you're going to have at least two of these problems on the exam. Just your standard voltage problem. Through what voltage difference must a proton initially at rest be accelerated to reach a speed of 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second? Now, you should be able to solve these problems really quickly because they're always solved the same way. Okay? Always the same way. When you're dealing with a proton or an electron, you don't worry about gravitational energy, so it's a trade-off between kinetic energy, initial to final, that's got to be the change in electric potential energy, initial to final, with a minus sign. When one's filling, the other one's draining. This is going to be kinetic energy final, minus kinetic energy initial, is equal, the minus sign comes down, this is going to be the test charge times the change in voltage from initial to final. Now in this case we're dealing with a proton and it's starting from rest. So the initial kinetic energy is zero. The final kinetic energy is going to be 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The final speed is going to be 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. And that's going to, the minus sign comes down, it's a positive proton. <coughs> I just solved for delta V. Am I going to get a positive or a negative answer? Negative. And that's what you'd expect. Protons speed up as the voltage goes down. They, they roll downhill, okay, if you think of voltage is <coughs> elevation. Okay, so I better get a negative answer then. Now, let's see, that one's similar. Let's try this one. Two small identical conducting <coughs> spheres. Uh, one of them carries a charge of plus Q, plus 5 Q. The other one has a charge of minus 1 Q. They're originally separated by a distance, capital L. I then bring them together and touch them, remember they're metal, 
and then I move them to their original separation of capital L. What is the ratio of the strength of the force on either charge after they are touched to what it was before they were touched? Okay? So, with your clicker, see if you can figure that out. Okay, we're running out of time. Get your vote in. Okay, the answer is not A. The answer is B. Okay, whoops. Let's look at this. The magnitude of the electric force, if I combine Coulomb's law with the definition of the electric field there, is going to be equal to KQ1Q2 over R squared, where R is L. So in this case, my Q1 is going to be my, uh, plus 5Q, and my Q2 is going to be minus 1Q. Now if I bring those together and touch them, the fact that they're identical and the fact that they're metal means they're going to share the charge evenly. I have a total charge of plus 4Q, so that means they're going to end up with plus 2Q and plus 2Q. And now the force, the magnitude of that force, is going to be K times 2Q times 2Q over the distance squared. Now what we want is the ratio of this to that. Well this is 2 times 2 or 4 and this is 5 times 1 or 5. So that's going to be a ratio of 4 to 5. So the answer is B. 19 of you got that correct. I hope there was no guessing. Okay. Let's try this one before we go. Three equal positive charges are at the corner of corners of an equilateral triangle. Point P is at the midpoint between two of the charges, Q1 and Q2. So here's a picture. If I have... An equilateral triangle, this would be Q1, Q2, Q3, they're all positive, they're all the same size, and a point P is halfway between 1 and 2. What direction is the electric field at point P? Is it going to be 0? Is it going to be not 0? But directed along the line from P to Q3? C not zero directed along the line from Q2 to P. D not zero directed along the line from Q1 to Q2. Or E, none of these is correct. Okay. We've got 30 seconds left, so answer quickly. Good, the answer is B. Q1 and Q2 give me 
E fields are canceled, and I get one due to three. That's the only one that doesn't count.